Bonjour, my name is Philippe Girin. Welcome back to my course on the history of the world before 1500. In the previous lecture, I covered some of the earliest civilizations of the Middle East. People like the Sumerians were credited with inventions like writing, metallurgy, mathematics, and literature in Mesopotamia. Today, we will cover ancient Egypt. This is a fascinating civilization with an incredibly long history lasting thousands of years. So obviously, I will only be able to scratch the surface. I will give you some general information before zooming in on one issue I find particularly intriguing, religion, especially under one pharaoh called Akhenaten. First, some generalities. Egypt is often referred to as a gift of the Nile, and you can easily understand why if you look at this satellite picture. The country is located in the northeast corner of Africa, at the edge of the Saharan Desert, in one of the driest areas of the world. So the vast bulk of the fauna and the flora, including humans, are concentrated along the banks of the Nile, which is really this country's lifeblood. Just like the Tigris and the Euphrates in, Mesop in Mesopotamia, uh, the Nile was key because it brought water, either right there along the, the banks or distributed a few miles further using irrigation techniques. Uh, once a year, the Nile would also overshoot its banks and flood Egypt. And a flood might sound like a catastrophe, including right here in southern Louisiana where I live, but it was a blessing. The flood brought water to distant fields, obviously, uh, and then when the waters receded, the flood left behind a fresh layer of silt, which made the fields unusually productive. Uh, you see the danger when you cultivate the same plot of land year in and year out, time and time again, which is what the Egyptians did, uh, that the nutrients of the soil will get depleted after a while. Uh, today we use modern fertilizers to fix this. Uh, the Egyptians didn't have that, so they used natural fertilizers like animal dung if they had it, or even better, the silt carried by the annual flood, which was like a brand new field brought to you courtesy of the Nile River year after year. It may seem weird to see such a large river flow through a desert. I mean, where does all that water come from? And also, why did the, the Nile flood like clockwork year after year? The origins of the Nile and its annual flood were long a mystery to geographers. It was only in the late 19th century that European geographers explored Central East Africa and found that the sources of the Nile were located, ta-da, in the Great Lakes region. Uh, it's much more humid in that area than Egypt, which explained, well, where the water comes from. Also, geographers discovered that the weather pattern in Central East Africa alternates between a dry and a rainy season. Uh, well, when it's the rainy season, the river swells and eventually floods Egypt downriver. That's the mystery of the flood. Uh, well, not anymore, in fact, because in the 1960s, an Egyptian dictator named Gamal Abdul Nasser built a dam called the Aswan High Dam across the Nile River. So the natural cycle of the annual flood, which had governed Egypt uh, since times immemorial, uh, that came to an end. But that's a modern issue, 20th century forward, uh, that did not impact ancient Egypt to this topic. So rivers bring water, but they also help with trade, remember? So in Egypt's case, the dominant winds come from the Mediterranean Sea in the north, so it was pretty easy to go up the river using a sailboat until well, you hit the cataracts of the Nile, that is. That's a set of obstacles further upriver. And if you wanted to turn around and on the way down, well, Egyptian traders would simply lower their sails and let the current bring them back easily to their starting point. At some point, Egyptians even built a canal to connect the Nile River to the Red Sea, and so from the Mediterranean to the Indian Ocean. And that was thousands of years before the modern Suez Canal was built, which is just amazing. The two traditional provinces of Egypt are called Upper and Lower Egypt. And just so that we're on the same page, Upper Egypt is at the bottom of the map, and Lower Egypt is at the top. And that might seem odd. So pause for a second and ask yourself, why is that so? Well, there is a reason for this madness. Since the Nile flows from south to north, Upper Egypt, the one on higher elevation, is in the south. Whereas the Delta area, where the Nile meets the Mediterranean Sea, that's called Lower Egypt because it's at sea level. So the Nile was so central to the ancient Egyptians that the river, rather than the North Star, for example, would structure the, uh, the space around them. Eventually, the two regions merged into a single united Egypt, the crown of the pharaohs, by the way, which symbolized that union because it combined the crown of upper and lower Egypt into one single crown. 
the fertile soil along the Nile meant that Egypt was densely populated and still is today, and that it was enough to sustain large cities uh, like Thebes, the capital, and later Alexandria in the north. And even then, there was enough of a surplus to export grain to other countries. Uh, Rome, in particular, was heavily reliant on Egyptian grain. Fruit was also abundant, as well as fish in the River Delta, so a kind of garden of Eden. An interesting peculiarity of Egyptian society was the important role played by women. I don't want to exaggerate, government offices were still held by men, and pretty much every pharaoh was a male. But Egypt was fairly egalitarian compared to other societies of the time, like ancient Athens, that were very sexist. Uh, women owned property in Egypt. Uh, women could take over her husband's business duties when he was away. Uh, Egyptian art often depicted women at the same size as men. And most importantly, brewing was done by women. And we all know that whoever controls the beer supply controls the world. I love teaching uh, online. Could never do that in a real class. Anyway. Egypt was a monarchy with nobles and commoners, uh, but it was possible for the son of farmers to go up in the ranks, for example, if he was smart enough and learn how to read and write. Uh, in that case, he could become a scribe, which is a Latin word that means somebody who can write, a public writer, and access more prestigious occupations like, I don't know, tax collector or government official or artist that would carve the hieroglyphics in the temple. Uh, being a scribe was highly valued in Egypt because the writing system was too complex. It was different from the Sumerian cuneiform that we studied before, or the Phoenician alphabet uh, from last lecture. That was called hieroglyphics. And these can be found everywhere in Egypt, even today. Uh, the Egyptians built massive uh, monuments, whether it's in the Giza Plateau, Karnak, Luxor, the Valley of the Kings, and wherever they, they built something, they sculpted or they, they painted uh, countless hieroglyphics on the walls. Heck, you can even find some of these hieroglyphics in the heart of Paris. Uh, there's an Egyptian obelisk that stands awkwardly in the middle of the Place de la Concorde, uh, right in the middle of Paris, in front of the hotel where Princess Diana spent her last night. Egyptians also used papyrus. It's not just a font, it's also a cheap writing material made of the fiber of the papyrus reeds, which grows abundantly in marshes like the Nile Delta. So you simply interlace uh, strips of papyrus on a flat surface, uh, you pound them in, into a single sheet with a mallet, uh, you dry the whole process, and voila! It's not quite as durable as cotton paper or vellum, which is made of animal skin, uh, but many fragments have still survived all the way to the present time, thanks to the arid climate of Egypt. Modern historical interest in Egypt began in 1798, when Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, who was then a general of the French Revolution, he was not emperor yet, was sent to Egypt to conquer the place, uh, like he liked to do. And this was the era of the Enlightenment in the 18th century, so Napoleon brought dozens of scholars with him to not just conquer uh, Egypt, but also to study the geography and the history of that country. And French scholars were fascinated by what they found. Everywhere, magnificent monuments indicating that a truly great civilization at once thrived there. And studying Egypt's history should have been easy because there was writing everywhere. Except that by that point, the 18th century, long after the end of Egypt, uh, no one knew how to decipher a hieroglyphics anymore, which was pretty frustrating. Uh, the most important discovery made by French scholars during the invasion by Napoleon was the Rosetta Stone, which is a big block of black basalt covered in writing. If you want to see it, well, don't go to Egypt, because the French army took it from the Egyptians, but don't go to France either, uh, because the British army later took it uh, from the French army. So now it's in the British Museum in London. Egyptians want the Rosetta Stone back, and same thing with the Elgin marbles, which were once a part of the Greek Parthenon, and now uh, they are in England as well. So should those artifacts be left in museums that have taken good care of them for centuries, or should they be returned to the country where they were created? I'll let you ponder that matter. History can be quite political sometimes. So what's so special about this one particular stone that the French, the British, and the Egyptians all want to have it? I mean, it's not like it's the only artifact from ancient Egypt. Well, if you look closer, you'll see three types of writing on it. Hieroglyphics, Demotics, and Greek. In 1799, when the stone was found during the invasion by Napoleon, 
hieroglyphics could not be read anymore, but demotics and ancient Greek could. So the stone could easily be deciphered. So by comparing those symbols you can read, like Greek, demotics, to those you can, such as hieroglyphics, uh, you could crack the code. So now you know why Rosetta Stone is a brand name for classes on foreign languages. But as it turned out, even with the original Rosetta Stone, cracking the code of the hieroglyphics took decades. Scholars couldn't figure out how the system worked. In the end, it was a French scholar, Jean-François Champollion, who deciphered uh, the Rosetta Stone in 1822. His key insight was that the hieroglyphics were not just pictographs like Chinese today, or an alphabet like our Roman alphabet, they were both. So the symbol for a cup uh, could mean a cup. But if you were trying to spell out a word in Egyptian for which there was no symbol, then you could use the cup symbol to represent the sound k, like cup. And ta-da, that's how Champollion uh, solved the code. When you think of ancient Egypt, you're probably thinking of mummies, right? The mummification process was fairly complicated and nasty. It involved removing soft organs like the liver and the brain, sometimes by using a hook that you would get up the, the nose into the brain, and then you would place all that into special jaws. Then you would rub the flesh with special salts uh, to remove the moisture, because microorganisms uh, that make bodies rot, they thrive in water, so it's key to remove the fluids to preserve uh, the body. Uh, then Egyptians would wrap the dried up corpse in linen wrappings and then they placed the embalmed corpse into a wooden or stone sarcophagus and then that would be placed, if you had enough money, into a, a tomb or a temple and in the dry Egyptian climate, corpses could be preserved that way for millennia. And that all seems gross or complicated, but the Egyptians did that on a massive scale, not just pharaohs and nobles were mummified, but anyone who could afford it, and even animals like crocodiles and cats. And over time, there were probably hundreds of millions of mummies that were produced, many of which have survived uh, to this day. As a little side note, the Egyptians were not the only ones to mummify their dead. Uh, later in the class, we'll study the Incas of South America, and they also mummified their dead, though in far smaller numbers and using a much simpler method. So you might ask, what's the point? I mean, in the Christian tradition, preserving the body is pointless. Only the soul goes up to heaven, so the physical body can be dumped into the ground or incinerated. Well, the Egyptians also believed in the outer life, but they had a different understanding of the role of the soul in the afterlife. Uh, they called that life force the Ka, K-A. And crucially, the Ka was a duplicate of the body that accompanied the body throughout life, uh, and after death, uh, left the body to take its place in the kingdom of the dead, but the cat could not exist without the body. And that's why it was so important to preserve the course, otherwise you might not survive after death. It was a key to eternity. And that's also why there was that bric-a-brac of beds and foods and toys and utensils in all the rich tombs of the pharaohs. The dead would be physically living uh, in the afterlife and they needed all that junk. So, like most of the ancient civilization I will cover, the Egyptians had, had an elaborate mythology, uh, hundreds of gods. Uh, some were associated with a specific power, uh, like the sky, death, the Nile. So, some of these Egyptian gods were depicted as animals, uh, and that was a source of constant mockery by Romans and, and Greeks. Because apparently for the Greeks, it was okay for Zeus to transform himself into a bull and rape a woman, but a god that looked like a cat. That was weird. Well, of all these gods, the two most prominent ones were Osiris and Isis, who were king and queen of the Nile Delta, husband and wife, as well as, uh, troublingly, brother and sister. Incest was pretty frequent among Egyptian royalty. According to the myths, Osiris was slain by a rival and dismembered. Uh, but then Isis put them back together and magically brought him back to life. And as if this was not enough, she then had sex with the corpse. From that union was born Horus, the third member of that trinity. Based on that story, you can guess that these three were associated with the Nile and resurrection, the afterlife. And that made sense to Egyptians in the way the Nile's flood brought Egypt back to life every year. And embalmers brought life back to the dead when they mummified the corpse, just like Isis did with her husband. So personally, I would not recommend incest and necrophilia. In Egypt, new gods could appear, or fall out of fashion, or even merge, just like big businesses today. Uh, the patron god of Upper Egypt was a sun god, Ra, 
uh, well, its equivalent in Lower Egypt was an air god called Amun. So when Upper and Lower Egypt were united into a single kingdom, the gods also merged and they became Amun-Ra, which was associated with the sun, but also unification and power, and the pharaohs. Uh, pharaohs would be the, the kings of Egypt, and they claimed to be the descendants of that union of the gods, which is one of the reasons they tended to intermarry. They didn't want their previous precious divine blood to mix in with the blood of mere mortals like myself. So from the get-go, you see that religion wasn't just about explaining how the universe was created or what happens to us after we die. It was des uh, uh, designed to justify the rule of the elite. Religion was about political power. As I mentioned earlier, Egyptian history is a very long one, not just centuries, but millennia in that case. So I can't go into a detailed chronology, uh, but let's just briefly retrace uh, the main strains uh, in this part of the lecture. So scholars split the history of ancient Egypt into three eras. You've got the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, and the New Kingdom. And they go all the way from 2700 BC to 1100 BC. And even then, there were pharaohs long after that. Uh, Cleopatra, for example, lived in the first century BC in the later dynasty. So the Old Kingdom, the oldest, obviously, uh, that was a time when Upper and Lower Egypt were first united around roughly 3000 BC. And the most striking development during that period was the construction of the pyramids. But did you ever wonder why those pyramids were built? Are those castles for war, temples for worship, palaces for leisure? Maybe not, right? A lot of windows. Uh, well, actually, the pyramids are mausoleums, elaborate tombs. Uh, they were incredible displays of early technology, and at the same time, they demonstrated the enormous power of old kingdom pharaohs. Uh, and at the same time, their main function was to hold the mummified remains of the king, of the pharaoh. The most famous group of these pyramids has the tomb of Pharaoh Khufu and is the oldest of the seven wonders of the world. And amazingly, the only one of the seven that still exists uh, today. It has a height of 446 meters, as I recall. And so that remained uh, the tallest building in the world for something like 4,000 years until Gothic cathedrals finally surpassed, uh, surpassed that record in the late Middle Ages. Uh, the picture you see here, that's the classical one from tourist brochures. So you go, you've got the pyramids, the desert, and even a, a camel to boot. Uh, well, the reality is a bit different. Uh, pyramids are right next to Cairo, which today is a huge metropolis of 20 million. So the photo can be a bit different depending on how you frame it. So the Old Kingdom ended around 2200 BC with a series of droughts uh, that resulted in great instability. You have a series of pharaohs that took to the throne, 20 of them in 20 years in the sink. Uh, which indicates that being perceived as a god had its advantages, but also its disadvantages. Sure, being a god justified your rule, but if you were a god, you were expected to control the climate. And if you could not, and there was a drought, then your legitimacy was questioned. It was like a double-edged sword. So after the Old Kingdom ended, pyramid building was abandoned in favor of small projects. For one thing, tomb raiders were an issue in ancient Egypt. And when there was such a huge pyramid next to a big city, it was a pretty good hint that there was a lot of things to loot inside. All the funeral chambers in the big pyramids are now empty. So later pharaohs preferred to build smaller tombs in secret locations so as to avoid desecration. So most of them were raided anyway, except King Tut's. After a period of chaos, the Middle Kingdom emerged around 2000 BC. And the pharaohs during that period identified themselves as saviors of the people uh, who gave charity to the destitute and to orphans. So being a god was not enough. The pharaohs also wanted to garner broad public support from the populace. Uh, this political philosophy resulted in more public works projects rather than the great pyramid projects of the Old Kingdom, uh, which only benefited one single person, the king. Uh, the Middle Kingdom was also a prosperous period, marked by a surge of trade between the Nile River and Asia. Uh, well, at least until political chaos set in again, Upper and Lower Egypt separated, and the Middle Kingdom came to an end. The New Kingdom, which lasted from roughly 1600 to 1100 BC, was a period of military expansion. You may remember from an earlier lecture that the first recorded battle in history is the Battle of Megiddo, 1500 BC, when an Egyptian pharaoh invaded Israel. Ramses II, probably the most famous warrior pharaoh, that's the one in the Bible, uh, he came from that period as well. Unusually, uh, one of these pharaohs was a woman called Atshepsut, 
And it's kind of rare to have a woman in charge at that time, so you might ask, how did she manage to overcome the sexism of her age and get the top job? Well, for one thing, she declared herself pharaoh at the death of her husband uh, when their son was only six and could not resist all authority. So she claimed to be a regent who ruled in the name of a man, her son. Also, she dressed as a man, which might seem weird, but was actually fairly common in history. Uh, Queen Nzinga of Angola, or the writer George Sand in 19th century France, also cross-dressed to overcome gender bias. I have episodes about those two in my radio show, if you're interested. So the reign of Ajib Sut uh, lasted six years, and then her son reached the ripe old age of 12, and then he overthrew his mom. What's interesting about Ajib Sud is that contrary to the male pharaohs we came before and after her, she avoided military expansion and instead focused on peaceful trade. This has led one political scientist, uh, J.N. Tickner, to argue in her book called Gender in International Relations that there's something fundamentally different about the way that men and women govern. Uh, you see women are from Venus. They're caregiving, nurturing people who choose peace. And men are from Mars, They're more aggressive. Uh, and thus responsible for the many wars that have plagued the world and history. Personally, I'm not 100% convinced by this theory. After all, some female rulers like Nzinga of Angola or Elizabeth I and Margaret Thatcher in England, uh, they weren't afraid of uh, waging wars themselves. Also, there have been fairly few female rulers in history, so it's difficult to have a representative sample. But it's an interesting theory. Another new kingdom of Pharaoh I find fascinating because it's a good example of today's topic of politics and religion and how they intertwine uh, is Akhenaten. Historians have described him as a precursor, a genius, a loony, a fanatic, uh, even a homosexual. So who was he? Well, to begin with, he started his life with a different name, Amenhotep IV, which means pleasing to Amen, Amenhotep. So there's no surprise here. Uh, we already saw that the cult of Amun-Ra was key to ancient Egypt, especially the rule of the pharaohs. But amun otep decided that the priests of Amun were getting too powerful, and instead he shifted his preference to a minor deity called Aten. And confusingly, Aten was also a god of the sun, just like Amun-Ra. So if I understand correctly, Aten was a representation of the disk of the sun, whereas Amun-Ra was a more general deity of the sun, but the difference is pretty subtle. Uh, it might have been a political move, a way to push out the powerful priests who worship Ammon. Remember, religion and politics are one and the same. As such, it was not an issue the pharaoh wished to pray to Aten, because in a polytheistic society like Egypt, you know, the more gods the merrier. Uh, but the pharaoh went pretty far, much further than that. He changed his name from Amen uh, pleasing to Ammon, to Aken Aten, which means glorious spirit of the Aten. Uh, as a way to showcase his preference uh, for Aten over Amen Ra. And he also abandoned all the other gods and insisted that his people do the same. So think of how much of a change that would have been uh, to Egyptians. Uh, the powerful priests of Amen, they lost their jobs and their influence. Uh, temples everywhere had to close. And then the average Egyptians were fearing that the other gods would get angry and mess up the annual flood or send a plague of uh, locusts. Uh, because their king had gone crazy. Worshipping a single god, monotheism, uh, was a revolution in its time. Until the advent of Christianity in the first century AD, uh, the only religion that was monotheistic was Judaism, which we'll study in the next section of the course. As if this were not enough, Akhenaten decided to move the entire capital city from Thebes to a new capital, El Amarna, which inconveniently was constructed in the middle of the desert. But that was the whole point. Uh, Akhenaten wanted to be closer to the sun, in an area where the sun rays would beat the ground mercilessly. And some temples in his new capital did not even have a roof, so that nothing could stop the rays of the sun. The Amarna period uh, also saw an important shift in art. Uh, depiction of the pharaoh now always included the sun disk, as if that god was everywhere, especially where the pharaoh was, as a way to justify his power. Note as well that the pharaohs would be depicted alongside his wife, at least one of his wives, the famous and beautiful Nefertiti, as well as their six daughters, which was unusual in official iconography. Instead of depicting the pharaoh ruling alone on his throne or waging war, uh, in that period he had incredibly intimate scenes of the pharaoh praying or enjoying family time with his kids. 
It's like a glimpse into unguarded moments from the past. And I find that very touching. Also unique to Amarna art was the way that the human body was depicted. Notice how the pharaoh's limbs are elongated, uh, so is his neck. He also has an androgynous appearance, neither male nor female, so much so that art historians have occasionally struggled to identify whether some statues represented him or his wife Nefertiti. As you'll see in a second, oftentimes the cartouche representing his name uh, was erased from the statues after his death. So there's been a lot of debate among art scholars as to why depictions of the pharaoh were so different during the Amarna period. Was it just specific to the art of that period? Uh, the way that Picasso deconstructed the human body during the Cubist period? Was it just a, a fad, uh, something passing? Or was it more of a caricature, the same way that modern cartoonists might represent President Bush or Obama with huge ears? After all, many Egyptians disliked their pharaoh, so they might have uh, made fun of him uh, through caricature. And it was fairly safe to mock the pharaoh uh, because he got blind from staring at the sun too much. Either that, although odd body proportions were a way to show that the pharaoh was different from mere mortal, that he was almost like an alien because he was a god. Also, pharaohs uh, often married close relatives, so they were also prone to suffer from genetic diseases. So scholars have proposed yet another theory, that maybe Akhenaten had Marfan syndrome, a genetic condition where patients are unusually tall and skinny, with very thin limbs and fingers, just like uh, Akhenaten. And to me, that seems the most plausible explanation, uh, but I'm not an expert on either ancient Egypt or genetics, uh, so don't take my word for it. At any rate, uh, when Akhenaten passed away, his son by another wife, uh, Tutankhaten, took over as pharaoh, and everything went back to normal. Uh, the son changed his name from Tutankhaten to Tutankhamun to celebrate Amun instead of Aten. Uh, he restored the cult of Amun-Ra, and he brought back polytheism. So the experiment came to an end. Uh, he and his successors even erased the name of Akhenaten from the public records so that his radical experiment with monotheism would not be repeated. A little side note, uh, the son of Akhenaten, King Tut, was a fairly minor pharaoh, so much so that his tomb was forgotten and not raided, at least until the 20th century, when it was finally discovered by an Egyptologist in an intact state, uh, which is unique for the tomb of a pharaoh. So King, Tut, uh, so King Tut found some immortal fame, not just for ending his father's experiment with monotheism, but also for showing us what a royal tomb looked like, which means pretty much a big mess. All right, so what can we say about the role of religion in the ancient world? Well, in a way, religion is something that makes humans human. When people bury their dead, when they worship gods, it means that they care for each other and that they ask profound questions about where we come from and what happens in the afterlife. And that was especially important in the ancient world because many natural phenomena were not yet explained by science and they had to be explained through the intervention of gods. But religion also mixed in with something more practical, state building, politics. In Egypt, the trinity of Isis, Osiris, Horus, and the twin god Amun-Ra were both used to explain and justify the rule of the pharaohs like Akhenaten. Deciding which gods should be worshipped and how, that was a profoundly political act that could precipitate a dynastic crisis, as was the case under Akhenaten. Well, we'll get back to all these issues in the next section because we'll be talking about religions of the world, and you'll see that religious history is not just about ideas, but also about politics and power. Before we get there, though, we need to do a different kind of philosophizing, and that one would uh, involve ancient Greeks and the way that they envisioned religion and state building. And that will be next lecture's topic as we move to Athens and Sparta. See you next time. Au revoir.